The Lord be with you. We welcome you to Zion today. We gather for worship. It's always a joyful day to be together. Uh, we have lots of cause for celebration at Zion. Today we're going to be celebrating in the middle of our service in our normal children's message time. The graduation uh, celebration for Juliana and for Brody. And so we're excited to celebrate with you today and the rest of your classmates. So we'll invite them up during the children's message time to honor them. So children, you'll stay where you are today, but we're going to bring up a couple big kids today and celebrate uh, on this milestone in their life. A few announcements for you in your worship folder. Uh, things coming up this week. Thursday afternoon at 1.30, our afternoon communion service. Make sure you let people know about this. This is especially great for those who maybe Sunday morning doesn't work for them. I'll let them know this is an opportunity to come and worship and receive Holy Communion. So this Thursday at 1.30. This Thursday at 6.30, we have our Ascension Worship. I invite you to be a part of this. Maybe you don't know why the Ascension is such a big deal. This is a great opportunity to learn this Thursday at 6.30. A couple other things. Uh, you have the opportunity now to register for VBS. You can do that through the link. You can do that out there at the sign-up table, the volunteer table, where you will also find the opportunity to sign up for the Memorial Day lunch. That's at the table with the lights on it can't see that, talk to me because we need to have other help for you because there's big lights around it. So you should be able to find it. Uh, also, there's an opportunity to be involved in uh, supporting our Hispanic missionary, Pastor Lopez, and that information is here. It says tacos for missions. The only typo I have on here is, this is about uh, having a taco booth for Ragbri. Ragbri doesn't come through till July 24. I put June 24. But the warm-up, the practice run, is correct June 10 at 1 o'clock at St. Paul in Carroll. So if you'd like to be a part of that effort to support uh, our Hispanic mission work here in western Iowa, uh, that's an opportunity for you to be involved. If you have more questions about that, I would have you talk to Jean Hargens because she's going to be participating with that and uh, she can answer those questions for you. Okay, um, other things. I think I covered the main ones there. Always an opportunity for you to be involved in the life of Zion. I pray you take advantage of those things. We have a lot to accomplish today, so let's go ahead and get right to it and turn to our first hymn.
we stand? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office, as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you, and in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. You have established the earth and it stands fast. By your appointment they stand this day, for all things are your servants. In your law, if your law had not been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have given me life. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Glory be to God on high. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray together. O God, the giver of all that is good, by your holy inspiration, grant that we may think those things that are right and by your merciful guiding accomplish them. 
Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our first reading is from Acts chapter 17. Paul finds himself in Athens and he reasons with the people of Athens and reveals to them, well, the God they do not know. We begin with verse number 16. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took hold of him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now, all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God, in the hope that they might feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. And even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle text is from 1 Peter chapter 3. We begin with verse number 8. Peter writes this. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless, for to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to the, their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, regard Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you. Yet... Do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. 
which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. Not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels and authorities and powers having been subjected to him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We stand for our alleluia. Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 14th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus is speaking. He says this, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. In that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. May be seated. Graduates, I invite you to come forward and join us here right up on the front step and face the congregation, please. I'm going to have you stand up here and I'm going to stand down here. We are very excited to celebrate this day with you. And I will be brief in my comments, but I want to remind you of your confirmation verses. These are the verses that you chose, and I think these are very applicable for your life today and as you go forward. Brody, you chose this from Matthew 28, 20. Jesus said, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. That's a remarkable promise, Brody. In fact, that's a promise that nobody else can make. We can't. We may think that we can be with people forever. That's not how reality works. But Jesus makes a promise that he is with you forever. That's a remarkable promise. And there are times when in life when we feel lonely. Yes? You've felt that before. You will have those times when you feel lonely. You are not alone. You have a a Lord and a Savior, Jesus Christ. That is his promise to you. And Jesus has a habit of keeping his promises. Never forget that, Brody. Juliana, you chose from Proverbs chapter 3. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. These are beautiful words. And I know as you go off to college, you have some question marks about what that will mean and what my major will end up. Those are, I, I have such empathy for young people. They're, we basically tell them, okay, when you graduate high school, you need to know exactly what you're going to do with your life. When you graduated high school, how many of you knew exactly the way that was gonna turn out? And did it turn out exactly like you thought? No, right. Uh, so. Uh, I can appreciate that pressure that's on you, but the thing I want to encourage you here is this. Whatever you do, wherever the Lord takes you, whatever path you go down, you go with the Lord, and you trust in him, you're faithful to him, and wherever the Lord takes you, he guides your path, he guides your way. And that promise, ultimately, it doesn't matter if you end up in this career or that career, to know that the Lord is with you and that he guides you and you can trust him, there's no greater promise than that. The neat thing about God's will for our life is this. It's not a tightrope. So it's not like you need to worry about, oh my goodness, I picked the wrong career. You don't need to worry about, or I picked the wrong job. You don't have to worry about that. It's not a tightrope. It's more of a path. And on that path, you can walk on the left side of the path. You can walk on the right side of the path. You can walk in the center of the path. There's great freedom on the path. Now, the Lord does say, beyond the path, don't go. There is a boundary. But on the path, there's great freedom. 
which allows you to explore different op op options and career paths, and not to worry that you pick the wrong one. So there's great freedom there. But you walk with the Lord, and he will bless that path. We're fully confident of that. Let's take a moment and pray for them, and then you can apply. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for Brody and for Julie. Thank you for your promises that you've given to them in their baptism. Thank you for the promises we hear in your word, that you will always be with us and that you will guide our path. Help them to trust your promises, to walk with you each day, to gather with your church, to receive that promise in the preached word and the given sacraments, and to treasure your love for them and the grace you give them in Jesus and through your chosen means in your church. Bless their paths, Lord. Let them find comfort in knowing that you walk with them. We commend them into your hands and we celebrate this graduation with them today. In Jesus' name, amen. So our, our congratulations. Brody, congratulations. Juliana, congratulations. You can return to your seats and we'll turn to our next hymn.
Grace to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. God speaks to us today in our epistle reading from 1 Peter chapter 3. We were in 1 Peter just a few weeks ago when we focused on the gospel grounding for holy living. That theme is at work today too, but we're going to add to that thought this week because Peter adds suffering. Peter knows the Christians he's addressing are facing opposition, they're being harassed, and in some cases persecuted for confessing Christ. So he writes to encourage them and to challenge them to bear up under the suffering. We're going to summarize Peter's point like this. Because of who you are, live like this and be prepared to suffer. Now, let's unpack that. First, let's appreciate who you are. Now, remember, Peter is addressing a specific group of Christians in Asia Minor, that's modern-day Turkey, but his words most certainly apply to us today because while the Bible wasn't written to us, so we aren't living in Asia Minor in the first century A.D., it was written for us. God breathed his word through Peter And his word speaks to us just like it spoke to them. So Peter says, and we talked about this a few weeks ago when we were in 1 Peter chapter 1. He says that God has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ to a salvation inheritance that is ours forever. In chapter 2, which we read last week, Peter says that you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. Now, let's make sure we appreciate who's controlling the verbs here, right? This is all God. He caused you to be born again. He chose you to be his people. You are who you are because Christ did what he did for you. So the first thing we need to do is really just appreciate who God has made us in Christ. Really, we just need to drink in our identity. You are an inheritor of God's everlasting salvation. You are chosen by God. You are kingly priests. You are his redeemed Israel, his holy nation. Now, we're not talking about America here. That's thinking too small. We're talking about God's Israel, his covenant people, the people incorporated into the promise of Abraham that all nations will be blessed in and by his offspring, which is Jesus. This includes you. You are the recipient of all God's grace and favor in Jesus Christ. You have been gospeled. You have a gospeled identity. You have a gospeled identity in Christ's church, and that carries over into your school. You have a gospeled identity in school. You have a gospeled identity at work. You have a gospeled identity as a father or a mother or a grandfather or a grandmother or uncle or an aunt. God has verbed you into this identity. He has taken action in Christ to secure this esteemed identity for you. Rich poor, healthy, sick, young, old, it doesn't matter. God has taken action in Christ for you to give you this identity. Now, how should you live? You see, Peter's very concerned about the witness our lives make. So he writes back in chapter 2, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak evil against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of his visitation. So remember a few weeks ago, we talked about that, those words exile and sojourning, Right? Peter wants you to see yourself, okay? Look in the mirror. You see yourself as someone who hasn't yet arrived in our promised land. So that means don't settle in. Don't fit in. Don't accept the world's ways. Don't settle for the lesser. 
Don't live like the world. Or to be a bit more direct, stop fooling around with drink and sex and mindless, time-wasting, soul-diminishing pursuits. These things, Peter says, war against your soul. I mean, hear those words. The sinful passions of the flesh war against your soul. Right? You need to remember, you're not a pleasure bot. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Peter wants you to appreciate who you are. And he wants to let that drive what you do. So you could call it what we called it a few weeks ago, the gospel grounding for holy living, or what we're calling it today, a gospel identity ethic. Either way, the point is that who you are, who God has made you, needs to drive what you do. The way you live in every dimension of your life. So Peter is concerned that you live out your gospel identity. In this letter, he's specifically concerned about living out that gospel identity in adversity. So he's really asking us, are you prepared to suffer? Do you know how to suffer well? More specifically, he's asking, do you face opposition to your confession of Christ well? Are you prepared to suffer for the name of Jesus? And as we'll see, he's asking you, are you prepared to defend your confession of Christ in the face of suffering? So Peter writes, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. Because of who you are in Christ, aim for unity. Show sympathy. Practice brotherly love. Demonstrate a tender heart and keep a humble mind. These are all virtues your gospel identity calls you to. It's a higher standard than the world, but that's because God has given you a higher name. Then Peter says, don't take revenge. And then most certainly, don't tell stories about how you told so-and-so where to go, about how you got the last word, about how you let her have it. I mean, it's, it's so sad. How many Christians devote so much energy, not only to getting revenge, but to boasting about it? It's a disgrace to the name of Jesus. It's a disgrace to your gospel identity. I mean, here's what I hear when people do this. It's like they're saying this, and then I took a shotgun and shot another hole in my boat. And when it ran out of ammunition, I went and got the hatchet. And I started hatcheting at the bottom of my boat. That's embarrassing. And it's shameful. That's not who God has made you to be. Peter says that we should be zealous for what is good. But that assumes that we know what good is. And that assumes we're actually and actively listening to what God calls good. That we're actively valuing and esteeming what God calls good. So, for example, we could go to the creation account and hear God calling the body good and hear God calling marriage good and hear God calling the careful stewardship of the earth good. And we would then dedicate ourselves to a zealous embracing of these goods to a zealous body-informed identity where we celebrate being created male or female, to a zealous extolling of the lifelong, exclusive, one flesh union of husband and wife who have been blessed with the potential to create new life. And we wouldn't partner with those who are making war on the body, 
deeming it irrelevant to identity. I mean, we wouldn't treat marriage like it's this sort of Play-Doh thing that, that we can form and shape into whatever form we want it to be. Or like it's just merely a piece of paper. We'll pick that piece of paper up later when we get around to it. We're going to live together for a while first, though. To be zealous for good, we could go to the Ten Commandments and learn how to be zealous to honor the name of God, how to be zealous to honor the day that God has set aside, to hear his word and praise him for his work in creation. We could learn to be zealous to honor our parents and other authorities that God has set over us. We could be zealous to honor life from the womb to the tomb, to honor sex and marriage, and to honor the fact that these two things are married. And divorcing them is a great disgrace. We could be zealous to honor property and reputation. And we could do all of this because God has gospeled us. Because God has made us his royal, priestly people. Because God has set us apart. Consecrated us for his holy purposes. This is what it means to live out our gospel identity. But Peter knows that doing this could very well lead to suffering, could very well lead to opposition, even persecution. Peter knows this, so he says, get ready. Get ready to suffer. And get ready to defend the gospel hope to which God has caused you to be born again. So Peter writes, even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason, a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. Okay, I want to press you just a little bit on this because I can hear some of you kind of thinking, well, I'm not facing any opposition to confessing Jesus, so I'm really not sure how this applies to me. Now, I'm not saying that we should go seeking opposition. Scripture never encourages that. But I do want us to ask a few potentially uncomfortable questions. Are you confessing Christ in word and deed? Are you confessing Christ in the way you spend your time? Well, we all have the same amount of time in the day and in the year, right? Some of it's spoken for in our jobs and eating and sleeping, but some of it we get to choose how we use. Does gambling help you confess Christ? Do hours of mindless media help you confess Christ? What about hours and hours and hours of reruns on TV? You see, Peter says, be prepared to defend the hope to which God has caused you to be born again. Now, I'm not suggesting there isn't a place for TV or media, although I can see absolutely no place for gambling in a Christian's life. But I am suggesting that to call to prepare, prepare is a serious call to which we should give serious attention and effort. So we're all familiar with the concept of military readiness, right? Those of you who've served in the armed forces or are currently in the reserves, our troops and our reserves, they train to be ready. They do drills to be ready. They go over scenarios to be ready. It's no different for us. Peter says, be ready. At the very least, that means being in worship consistently. But surely that can't be all. Bible study is a part of being ready. Reading Zion's newsletter is a part of being ready because Catherine and I write articles specifically to equip you. Having a regular Bible reading routine is a part of being ready. And I would happily, I know Catherine would too, happily recommend wonderful podcasts and books to help you be ready. And don't tell me that you can't. Yes, you can. Everybody can and must prepare. Peter doesn't carve out any exception clauses here because there is no one in Christ who hasn't been granted this new birth. 
this living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So if you have the hope, you have the exhortation to be prepared to defend this hope. And you have the sober acknowledgement that confessing Christ and extolling this hope may bring suffering with it because it may attract opposition and persecution. Now, I want to offer a brief aside here. What we can't do is adopt a persecution mentality where we flippantly and offhandedly claim a victimhood status. We run around bemoaning how persecuted we are, how victimized we are. We must not do that. Christ was the victim. We in Christ, no matter what we experience in this life, we are the victors. So this reality of opposition for confessing Christ and even the possibility of persecution is not a status or an identity that we are to adopt. Because remember, we have a gospel identity. Yes, we may suffer to confess Christ. And I want to give you just one real-life example in just a minute. But our identity is not in victimhood. It is the victim, it is in the victim turned victor, Jesus Christ. We have a gospel identity, and no opposition or persecution can touch that. Now, let me give you a real-time example of the cost that we may soon face for confessing Christ. This is very close to home. Did you know that Minnesota has recently amended its laws so that the state may now remove a child from his or her parents' home if that child's parents do not embrace a gender-affirming ideology for a child who claims gender dysphoria? So, read the statute. Here's what it says. Right after abandonment and abuse, right after abandonment and abuse, in the law comes language on removing a child from the parent's home for parents who do not endorse an ideology that denies the value and relevancy of the body for identity. So if a child claims gender dysphoria and the parents object to hormone, ther hormone therapy and surgery, the parents object, the state can remove that child from his or her parents' home. There is more to this law, and there are more states passing similar laws. Our point for now is that being zealous for what God has called good, the very thing Scripture exhorts us to do, is going to bring opposition and suffering. Are you prepared? Are you prepared not to adopt a victimhood identity, not to panic, but to embrace your gospel identity in Christ and to teach your kids and your grandkids how to embrace this identity and to give them a defense for a li the living hope that you have? And are you prepared to suffer in order to make that defense? Are you prepared? The time to prepare is not after the suffering comes, but before. The time to prepare is now. Peter's letter is a great place to start. Study it. Imbibe it. Read, mark, learn, inwardly digest it. Embrace your gospel identity and prepare to make your defense of your living hope. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now the peace of God that passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord to life everlasting. Amen. We stand. This is part of our practice here. This is part of preparing. It's confessing with confidence the creeds. And I've said this before. Confess them with your children in your home. Out loud. Practice at home. We confess together. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, 
and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We gather our offering. You may be seated. Kids, you can bring your offering forward. Thank you. We stand to pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for our gospel identity. Baptized into Christ, we have been called your chosen royal priesthood, a kingly nation. And we have been called out of the darkness specifically to proclaim the excellencies of you who called us out of that darkness. Help us then to prepare to defend the hope that you have given to us in the living, resurrected Jesus Christ. Open our eyes to how we can prepare. Help us to dedicate ourselves to the study and the hearing of your word and of the confessing of that word to our children and to our community and beyond. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We celebrate with our graduates, with Brody, Juliana, and for Leggy. And we pray that you would continue to minister to them in your church. 
bringing your word to bear, that they may hear it with joy and faith, that you may guide their paths as they go forward. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for Lyle Munt, Tanya Jacobson, John Bexton, Jim Devers, Rick Spock, Justine Schwizo, Sherry Steffes, Corey Aronson, Kenneth Graves, Tom Wagner, Brandon Long, Susan Lamb, and Juanita Kurth. We ask that you would give them grace for each day. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer for our missionaries, for our cross-cultural worker, that you would embolden them to confess Christ where you have called them, for our law enforcement and military men and women, that you might protect them from harm. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer, that you would bless, Lord God, our partnership with Trinity in Manila and our preschool, that through our preschool, children may know Christ, and through our partnership, your kingdom may be extended. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for peace both in Ukraine and throughout the world, that you would bring the cessation of war, that you would bring that through the spread of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Embolden and enable your church to bring that gospel to the four corners of the earth, that we may know peace in Christ. These prayers we bring before you in the name of Jesus, our risen Lord. Amen. We continue with the service of the sacrament. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up unto the Lord. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is fitting and right so to do. It is truly fitting and right and edifying that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, and most especially are we bound to praise you on this day for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, the very Paschal Lamb, who was sacrificed for us and bore the sins of the world. By his dying, he has destroyed death, and by his rising again, he has restored to us everlasting life. Therefore, with Mary Magdalene, Peter, and John, and with all the witnesses of the resurrection, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing it together. We pray together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way, also took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do, as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.
We're going to skip the, the uh, Nunc Dimittis, but before I have you stand for the benediction, um, one brief announcement. Uh, on Thursday, I received a completely surprise phone call from a church in Carrollton, Missouri, named Emmanuel, and they have issued a divine call to me, so I will be considering that. I do encourage your questions and your prayers. Uh, as I mentioned, the first day I heard of Carrollton, Missouri was on Thursday. So uh, this was all brand new to me as well, just as surprised as you are. Uh, so I'm processing that call, and I certainly welcome your prayers and questions. If you just want to know how the call process works and you know, any questions you have about that, I certainly welcome that and your feedback on ministry at Zion. As always, you are encouraged to be a part of that conversation. But I need to communicate that to you because I received that on Thursday and will be deliberating over that uh, in the coming days. So I invite you to stand for the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. We sing our final hymn.